Thank you with EPRI. I wanted to uh, thank you all for making time to attend uh, this Digital Grid Virtual Workshop event. Uh, we're delighted uh, you could be here and I'm pleased to be your host today along with our keynote speaker, Mark McGranigan, and our distinguished uh, panel that will be speaking. I uh, just wanted to first, uh, uh, additional welcome you, go over a little bit of uh, housekeeping. Uh, presently, uh, for those of you who are attending, uh, everyone is auto-muted given the size of the, um, of the number of attendees. Uh, there are uh, two ways that you can ask questions during the uh, webcast. Uh, one is to uh, hit the chat feature at the bottom uh, where uh, you can see there where it's, it's noted. Uh, and you can type in a question. Uh, you can also uh, submit a question by uh, raising your hand as indicated in the uh, WebEx toolbar and uh, we can at the appropriate time unmute you to ask your question. I will say that for this, chat, for this size of uh, uh, meeting that the chat feature is probably going to be the most convenient way to, to ask your question, so we uh, invite you to do that. Uh, we are recording this webcast session, so your participation is your consent to that recording. And the recordings of this webcast and the presentations themselves will be posted on both uh, the EPRI and Stanford uh, websites um, at the appropriate time. And we will provide that information once it is available. Uh, so we are uh, really excited about this, uh, this week's sessions and uh, some sessions to come that uh, I will uh, uh, touch upon. Um, and some of the objectives for, uh, for this week's uh, sessions. Uh, we want to present a vision of uh, what a shared integrated digital grid uh, represents. And uh, that will be uh, followed by the convening of experts here that we've, distinct, that we've assembled here today for our U.S. utility panel, as well as in our successive panels over the next two days uh, to discuss uh, gaps to achieving this vision, um, principally uh, a gap that has uh, been identified through some prior discussion preceding this event around enabling data platforms uh, to uh, enable a digital grid. And if you have received some of the uh, material that accompanied the registration, uh, you may have read briefly about this, and we will be uh, talking about this as a theme uh, throughout our, our session. Uh, we will be discussing here as well, particularly today, understanding some of the utility requirements and plans around uh, this digital grid vision, which, again, uh, can entail many different aspects, and also uh, discussing some technology solutions to help bridge those gaps. And that'll be one of the themes of, of some of the, um, the upcoming uh, events as well. And this is all really intended to help inform a, a robust research roadmap as an, as an industry and to hopefully inform a collaborative research initiative that is very much a priority for EPRI on behalf of the, uh, of the industry. And as you can see there in the chart on the right, uh, there are many different aspects that a enabling data platform for uh, a digital grid can encompass with the customer being at the center. And uh, in very general terms, one of the uh, ideas that, that uh, Mark McGranigan uh, will articulate is the idea of being able to integrate customer resources, customer DERs, customer technologies uh, in a variety of ways that can assess, uh, that can uh, improve uh, the flexibility of the grid and in a way that doesn't compromise the value that the customer, um, that the customer receives from, from his technologies. So there are many different aspects that are involved from uh, in integrating this dispatch to ops and planning, the application of, of uh, AI, uh, common information models to enable a transactive energy uh, you know, paradigm, all with data security uh, for, for the customer uh, being, uh, being paramount. So these are just some of the uh, aspects that will be touched upon over the, uh, over the sessions to come. Just a bit of background here, and uh, you know, EPRI is pleased to co-host this series with the Stanford Bits and Watts Initiative. Um, we have been working together for uh, a number of months originally uh, to plan this as a physical workshop that was to have taken place in March. Obviously, circumstances are such that we weren't able to uh, do that physical uh, workshop, 
but these virtual workshops, these webinars are the uh, substitute and uh, fortunately we're able to continue in this way. A brief word about each, uh, you know, EPRI is an independent not-for-profit research organization. We're focused on uh, research on the generation, delivery, and use of electricity, and it's for the public benefit. And we, our research is ultimately aimed to improve the, uh, or to advance the safety, reliability, um, efficiency, affordability, and environmental sustainability and health of electric uh, service through collaborative research. Uh, speaking briefly on behalf of uh, the Stanford Dixon Watts Initiative, and uh, pleased that uh, Liang Min and his colleagues have been um, instrumental in helping to uh, set these meetings up uh, and have been a wonderful partner for us. Uh, the Bits and Watts Initiative is a major initiative at Stanford focused on digital innovations for the electric grid. And their uh, mission is to help advance business innovation, policy supporting customer control and end user technologies. Uh, to recast the relationship between consumers and the grid. And really both of us, and I also want to acknowledge VMware uh, that has been a, a contributing sponsor and has done a lot of work uh, to help in uh, setting up the and planning uh, this event and the events that are following this week. Uh, but we all really share uh, the same workshop goal overall, which is to convene uh, the experts that you see here and over the next few days uh, experts from the utility space, from technology, uh, academic leaders, that'll be something here throughout the summer, uh, to develop a research roadmap uh, for the standardized data platform to help interface customer DERs with the grid and ultimately informing a collaborative research initiative. And the uh, last bit of uh, housekeeping, again, this is just the, uh, the start of uh, upcoming events. This week, um, after today's event, we will have our European utility uh, panel uh, that will be uh, happening at the same time tomorrow. Uh, Liang Min from Stanford will be hosting and Arun uh, Majumdar from Stanford will be the keynote. And Mahir Chebo from uh, GE Digital uh, will be the moderator. And then on Thursday, at the same time, uh, we will have a technology panel uh, and the keynote speaker uh, will be David Tenenhaus from VMware and the moderator, Nicola Peel Moulter uh, from VMware. And uh, finally, and lastly, uh, we are planning a weekly summer webinar series beginning July 1st that will probe in uh, some more detail uh, aspects of the integrated grid and, or, and digital grid, and we will have some um, academic and technology and other experts provide some deep dive perspectives on, uh, on their research and other ongoing activities. So we're very excited about that, and both the Stanford and EPRI sites will be repositories uh, for this information. So uh, you will be receiving notifications about this, and we, we thank you for your, your participation. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, my colleague, uh, Mark, Mark McGranigan, Vice President of Innovation at EPRI to give our keynote address and the sort of vision for the digital grid. So Mark, uh, turning it over to you. Okay, so I'm now the presenter. Does that mean I can move the slides or are you gonna move the slides just as a curiosity? You should be able to have... move the slides, Mark. So I can, okay. Beautiful. All right, thanks a lot, Omar. And I'll second uh, Omar's comments that we're really delighted to be um, co-sponsoring this series with the Stanford Bits and Watts program and VMware and, and uh, really look forward to this being a kickoff to uh, a very interesting uh, and I think uh, useful series of discussions that, that can help move this topic forward around the digital grid. And I'm especially interested in this aspect of integrating the customer and the community. And I think you'll hear a lot about that um, in these next couple of days. Uh, today's, uh, today we'll get a perspective from, from some U.S. utilities that are, are very active in this innovation space. And tomorrow um, we'll get kind of a European perspective, which is very exciting. And I, I thought I just started off with uh, a discussion of, of uh, you know, what we're talking about with this digital grid and customer integration. And we, we've been talking about the the concept of an integrated grid for a number of years now, um, kind of moved from the smart grid terminology to the integrated grid to really emphasize that it is about um, 
distributed resources, the customer, the community, all being part of of making the the grid as efficient and um, you know optimized as possible. And I, I like to use this this phrase at the bottom where we talk about taking the fact that we're going to be managing our energy use locally, community, household, building, uh, more and more, there's more and more technology available for that. And our challenge as a utility is, uh, is, is making that local energy optimization part of the global energy optimization. optimization. And, and that's what the integrated grid is all about, taking advantage of those resources, making them part of the the uh, operation of the grid. And a lot of it comes down to this question of flexibility. As, as we decarbonize and integrate more and more renewables that are variable intermittent, um, storage is a solution. That storage could be in an electric car that's in someone's driveway. It could be a large bulk storage system on the grid, or it could be um, a storage system that's integrated with a local PV system on someone's roofs. And, you know, equally it could be in in both smart appliances. So there's a there's a huge opportunity to realize some of this flexibility requirement from local resources, whether it's capacity management, frequency regulation, handling ramping requirements, uh, whatever it is. And and that's that's part of this integration equation. And it's providing another value possibility for customers and communities to, to participate in the grid where they may have additional value streams of improving their own efficiency or resiliency. But uh, this flexibility part of the equation is, is, is very important, I think. We coined this phrase of the shared integrated grid that Omar mentioned. Uh, we developed a little video about that that you can track down uh, on the internet, I'm sure just looking up shared integrated grid, you'll find this. We're not going to listen to it today. It actually is about four minutes long, and it gets uh, you get the same message over and over again. But it, it's I think it's a cute cute video and, and useful. But the concept is that household, building, community can be part of 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 the grid and, and managing the grid. And there's a there's a lot of examples of this going on around the world. Um, we have a, a project that if you're following the Department of Energy and their upcoming um, initiative that they'll be putting out a, a request for proposals on around uh, advanced buildings and smart neighborhoods, they, they really highlighted this uh, smart community concept that Alabama Power of uh, Southern Company has, um, has, has put in place near Birmingham, and that, that's a, a great example uh, with, with smart homes integrated with grid operation, with storage and a community PV. The uh, Exelon has the Bronzeville community that, that starts to tie in uh, a lot of community concepts, uh, resiliency, microgrids, um, as well as efficiency and other community services. I'm, I'm coming from you in Ireland today. In Ireland, we have a, a project on the, the Dingle Peninsula that is uh, a real forward-looking project of, of uh, enabling individual households and the community to participate in efficiency, electrification, and resiliency needs of the grid uh, through their, their flexible operation and uh, put a platform in place for that. The next next year, they're going to be doing peer-to-peer uh, -peer trials uh, for energy management within that, that community in the Dingle Peninsula. And I like to use the uh, Australian example. There's many more examples around the world, but I think in terms of virtual power plants and distributed storage in particular, um, you know, you're seeing uh, you're, you're, you're seeing major advancements in, in Australia. It's just in South Australia, you know, stage three of the virtual power plant trial there is going to have 50,000 homes that will have energy storage, be 250 megawatts and 16, 650 megawatt hours of, of storage that, that, that can provide flexible flexibility uh, for the grid. So it's a, it's a great example. It's taken off. There's a platform in place to integrate that virtual power plant with the with the market 
And uh, so it's some, some real good examples to, that we can track as we go forward. And we'll hear about some, some of the, the work going on from our, our utility folks that will be on the panels both, both today and tomorrow. So we, got, we do have a lot of challenges, and that's what uh, makes it interesting from an R&D point of view as we try to achieve this integration. We're really still working on the architecture to figure out how to integrate the Internet of Things kind of devices, smart appliances, customer technologies with the grid operations. So that's a, that's a challenge. We need communications to make that work. We're seeing a lot of, um, a lot of, of innovations in that space, private LTE, but secure ways to take advantage of, of the existing communication infrastructure on the Internet, how it interfaces with the market. You mentioned that Australian example. Um, that, that uh, a lot of challenges and innovation that, that's required there. And we need to make this actually part of the way we plan the grid, or we're not going to really make that value proposition available to, to customers and communities. So modeling uh, approaches and tools to, to integrate these distributed resources and the customer with our planning uh, approaches and then then actually operating those uh, systems through a, a, a DERMS distributed energy resource management system um, and other approaches. And all that is going to depend on on some platforms that have have uh, open and 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 standard um, APIs and 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 interface approaches for sharing of information between all the stakeholders. It is secure and and recognizing the privacy requirements of that information as well. And as we look at, especially here in Europe, where the transmission and distribution system operators are, are definitely different companies, that, that requires a lot of coordination between, between those entities as well. So these are some of the challenges that we're working on from an R&D point of view, and we want to chat about in these, uh, in these panel sessions, but, but we're, we're very excited about, about the opportunities. One thing that you'll see is demonstrations going on around the world. Um, we created a, a, a demonstration um, site that, that tracks some of these demonstrations, and we're continuing to expand that. That uh, You should be able to find that, igdemos.epri.com, and under keywords, see some of these demonstrations and, and track progress on them that are going on around the world. So that's exciting. And uh, really look forward to the discussion. I'm going to be on here. I would uh, encourage you to, to use the chat. Uh, function that's available. Go, you can go ahead and introduce yourself on the chat, and uh, I'll be watching it to ask questions, and we can use that to bring questions forward to the panelists as well. So um, just a suggestion. We've had good success with that on the COVID-19 webcast that we've been doing and other, other uh, activities in the virtual world over, over these past months. So Look forward to the discussion and thanks again to Liang and the team at Stanford for helping put this together and VMware for, for supporting it. Thanks a lot, Omar. I'll turn it back over to you. Great, Great. Mark. Thank you very much for, for laying out that, uh, the vision. Uh, I'm going to turn it over now to our moderator for today, Rish Gathigar. Uh, Rish is a senior program manager in our information communication and cybersecurity uh, research area. And uh, he'll be uh, leading this session and introducing our panelists. So, Rish, uh, turning it over to you. Thank you, Omar. I appreciate that. And um, you can hear me, right? Yeah. All right. Uh, great. Uh, so, uh, thank you for an excellent background. That's very helpful. Um, you know, Mark uh, set the uh, kind of groundwork uh, to some extent on what actually the whole area of digital grid and what emphasis we are uh, planning to here at EPRI in terms of focusing on the customer resources, right? Uh, at the end of the day, every, every electron that gets generated is because somebody wants it, or somebody wants to consume it. Um, so customers become a very integral part of this whole equation of uh, integrated grid and, and also playing a very key role in determining the reliability, resiliency, efficiency of the electric grid. So that with that theme, um, uh, we have a, 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 you know amazing, um, uh, a talented and expert uh, set of panelists today that represents um, you know, uh, different parts of uh, the country, um, the electric utilities that um, are from all the way from East Coast uh, and, and, and all the way to the West Coast and, and, and in the middle as well. 
Um, so with that, um, so I can move the slides, right, Orly? All right. All right, so yes, I can. Um, so the, these panelists will describe, um, in general, focusing on the U United States, because uh, you know, we do have a panel tomorrow that's focusing on the European context. From the US context, we're looking at experiences. What are utilities doing in this space that are very relevant uh, uh, that we all can learn from? Uh, for me, the challenges are very important because challenges lets us know what, where the opportunities really lie and what should be done uh, to address those challenges, what technology solutions, what aspects of uh, tools development, um, you know, communications, et cetera, are very relevant. Uh, then, and finally, the focus on this particular, um, uh, you know, uh, initiative is on the data requirements because, uh, you know, uh, digital grid needs automation, automation needs information exchange, information comes from data, end of the day. So if you want to look at that, um, the data becomes a solid foundation for everything. Um, that is something that has changed quite a bit in recent years. Um, you know, the whole area of data analytics, um, optimization, uh, modeling has become a very critical part. Uh, and the more data and accurate um, and uh, high frequency data you have, more, uh, you know, a reliable uh, uh, forecasting, for example, you could have um, and also lead towards new services and business model from the utility perspective. So with that, um, you know, uh, the customer side of resources is our emphasis, uh, but from the grid objective, how can we improve grid flexibility, reliability, and enhance customer experience? So these are some of the key themes uh, that this panelists will be uh, talking uh, today. Uh, the way we have structured the panel um, today is each of the panelists will uh, provide prepared remarks. We have three panelists. Um, and uh, uh, each of them around 10 to 12 minutes will provide a prepared remarks, they have presentation. Um, then we will have an interactive discussion. Um, our plan is to have at least around 20 to 30 minutes for interactive discussion. As Omar alluded to uh, earlier, um, you know, if you have any questions, feel free to send us in the chat, we'll be monitoring that, um, you know, uh, and then plus at the interactive discussion, uh, raise your hands. Uh, we do have some curated questions as well, um, that might help uh, just in case uh, we do have an opportunity to uh, ask more questions to the panelists. Uh, we uh, request you to mute your audio to limit uh, your background noise. By default, everybody is muted, um, um, just for information. Uh, the panelists that we have today, uh, the three people that I mentioned, I'll start from the, uh, you know, uh, the alphabetical order, starting with the name of the utilities, John Hughes. Uh, he's the Director of IT Network Engineering and Operations at Ameren Corporation. Um, John has worked uh, all his life in Ameren's engineering and information technology area for the last 33 years. A um, uh, 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 very uh, knowledgeable guy, at least, uh, uh, you know, uh, every time I talk to him, I learn something new. Um, uh, he's got his uh, uh, bachelor's in electrical engineering from the University of Missouri and MBA from Webster University. Um, he's also on the pre advisory board for information uh, communication technology program. The second um, you know, uh, expert uh, and panelist we have is Lara Pierpoint. She's the Director of Technology Strategy at Exelon Corporation. Um, uh, Lara is one of the very amazing, uh, you know, uh, very active women I have seen and with, with, who brings in a great set of passion, knowledge uh, in this field. Um, she, at Exelon, she focuses on energy technology innovation and leads the corporate strategy team in advancing energy technology trends. A very suitable topic for our uh, uh, panel today. She has PhD from MIT Engineering uh, and, uh, and dual MS degrees from MIT Nuclear Engineering and Technology Policy. Uh, the last uh, panelist, uh, uh, you know, uh, equally uh, preeminent and uh, equally uh, knowledgeable is Larry Beckethal. Uh, he's the Vice President of Grid Architecture at Portland General Electric uh, on the West Coast. Um, he advances PGA strategy to build a grid of the future, and uh, one that is resilient, smart, and delivers clean energy future. All very, again, relevant to uh, today's discussion. Um, Larry has BS in electrical engineering from uh, Montana State University. He's also on the FA Advisory Committee, as well as uh, Stanford University's Bits and Bots Advisory Council. Uh, with that uh, introduction to the panelists, I'll open the uh, uh, panel to John Hughes um, for his prepared remarks. John, please go ahead.
John, can you hear me? You must be on mute. Rich, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, John. Thank you. Sorry about that, guys. Thank you for inviting me to be part of the panel. Uh, Rish, Mark, and Omar, I'm excited. Um, I'm very excited to be on the panel with Larry and, and Laura as well. Um, I just a little bit about Ameren. We're based in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, that is the Gateway Arch. That's probably the symbol for our uh, territory. I'm not sure how to advance the slides, Rish. Uh, well, Orly, does uh, John have the controls advanced slides or you want me to? It should it should have the the controls now. Okay, great, John. Um, there you go. Got it. Thanks. So a little background about Ameren. Uh, our service territory, 64,000 square miles, just south of uh, Chicago, the Exelon territory up there, uh, through the eastern two thirds of Missouri. We have six million um, people that we serve, roughly 9,000 employees. In Missouri, we have 10,000 uh, megawatts of energy generation, nuclear, hydro, coal, solar, wind, uh, and combustion turbine. We've got 2.4 million electric customers across the two state, 900 plus gas customers, um, 7,900 miles of transmission wire, 4,500 miles of which have OPGW or will have. Uh, that's the fiber optic communications that we're installing. And we have a current investment through 2023 of over $11 billion in the three companies, the Transmission, Ameren, Illinois, and Ameren, uh, Missouri. Just a, a quick comment, and I think it dovetails with uh, some of the high-level objectives that Mark alluded to and really what each utility strives to be, and that is a good steward of our resources. Uh, starting with the environment. We've done a great deal to lower our carbon emissions since 2005, almost 24%. And we have a target of reduction of 80% by 2050. And along with that, we've already reduced by 49% uh, uh, nitrous oxide as well as um, sulfur dioxide emissions. Uh, the energy plan in Missouri, we're investing $5.3 billion to upgrade the infrastructure in Missouri, that's going to include a life cycle generation on meters from AMR to AMI, utilizing those meters as part of our customer portfolio. Uh, the Smart Energy Plan also uh, will be upgrading a lot of our equipment and grid operations. You'll see a lot more distribution automation, uh, a great deal more. Uh, and eventually, we want to embrace more DER and give customers additional choice in, in how they utilize our energy. We'll talk a bit about that. Uh, that work also creates jobs in both states, and so that's a positive that our customer base and folks that live in our territory. The vision of the future, you know, the energy environment is going to change drastically. Working with EPRI, we like to say that the center of value is going to be the grid. No longer is it the big, you know, coal plants generating power. It's going to be how we make and provide access to the grid for customer choice, for capabilities and reliability. Uh, we see customers will have new ways to, to get involved with how they consume and use our products, the two-way flow of energy, storage, as you talked about, different electrification capabilities. Grid modernization and smart technologies should provide greater control of value to the customers. You know, we illustrate a customer example on the right there, different choices through an app. And there's also different choices about how they uh, sit and work on the grid. Can they be a partner of the Ameren? Uh, can they drive energy efficiency? Um, the key thing here is, uh, as utility companies, we need to be agile, we need to be customer-centric, innovative. And I think Ameren's leadership has done a lot to be innovative. Um, we do see electrification of the transportation and major manufacturing industries um, is really where the future of you know, demand is going to come, and so we have to be ready to support that. And that's a distributed load, but it's also a distributed source that we have to consider. I look at some of the emerging technologies that we've actually tested. And at Ameren, we have a large technology uh, assessment center built in Champaign, Illinois. And in that facility, we have everything from wind and solar, uh, gas generation, battery storage, 
It's grid connected. It's a microgrid control with uh, both secondary and tertiary controls. Um, and we use that platform also to provide uh, customer appliance testing, smart lighting testing. And so it's been a, a great asset to prove out capabilities around distributed energy and how to manage those, those capabilities. It's a center where we can engage customers as well as manufacturers to, to think about how the future would look. How do we engage customers? Some of the things that you know we've been dealing with cybersecurity in that world. We work with Rich and, and EPRI on a simplified version of DERMS management using the open source tool. How do we build an architecture for communications? And understand, I come from a communications background, so that's my primary focus. Um, and the one thing about being in the, the network team is you get a little bit of everything the industry and the company's doing because you're the connected piece of that, that fabric. Uh, machine learning is another area we're doing some work. Customers will benefit by getting more intelligent offerings, more of an omni-customer approach when they contact us. But soon that will be available in operations. Uh, smarter devices, better suggestions on where problems and opportunities, predictive uh, maintenance and troubleshooting. We're already doing drone testing. We've got um, waivers with the FAA to do the online of site testing with drones on our transmission lines using communications with those drones to capture images and do assessments. Uh, that's still in pilot. Uh, augmented reality, we've done a number of different examples of augmented reality. Uh, that's more for the coworkers' capabilities, but it does improve cost and reliability. We've done a lot with virtual reality in our nuclear plant where we train and um, teach people how to operate steam pipe maintenance um, through virtual reality classrooms. It's been very successful. That's uh, in a daily use. Uh, again, I talked about the distributed energy already. Things like pole sensors will add more data points to our network. Expanded customer services and control around energy efficiency. In Illinois, there's a mandate. We're doing things with bolt bar optimization. We want to do more with the capabilities around DERs. And again, the electrification of transportation. We're working with manufacturing industries, making sure that we have electrical driven forklifts and equipment of that nature. I think the one thing I'd like to just stress is all these capabilities come through different processes and services. Um, and every one of those processes and services relies on data and touch points. But without that fabric of the network, you're not going to get any of that. So my focus in a lot of my conversation today will be building that work network to give you reliable data and access. When I look at Ameren's strategy around the foundational grid from a network perspective, we want to minimize dependency on carriers, lease services, moving away to a private network. We feel we have greater cybersecurity control, better reliability and recoverability. And so we put a lot of effort into building out a robust backbone using fiber optic communications. Work we worked uh, and designed uh, this MPLS network, working with EPRI with Tim Godfrey's group. We think that we can lower our overall operating expenses substantially over a period of time by, by building our own networks. We also piloted uh, and installed the first pilot outside a Southern company on a private LTE. We tested over 14 use cases. It was published in UTC, and we did a lot of research with EPRI on those capabilities. Um, the, the success of that was greater than we had anticipated. Um, not only was it more reliable, uh, it was easier to install, and we even built in failover with that. So we're currently looking at moving all of our 20 existing wireless network solutions into a private LTE. We'll still maintain a mesh network for our metering systems, but the backhaul on that will come through that private LTE. Um, and again, uh, a standardized packet-based end-to-end network gives me a standard platform for which I can move data and have access. The network will be segmented based on business and reliability. And again, some of the efforts I outlined there, working with EPRI, we worked with Tim Godfrey on an energy roadmap with the Department of Energy. Uh, industry published research with the private LTE and cellular carrier QoS. Um, <clears throat> we are founding members of the Utility Broadband Alliance, in which uh, we um, encourage EPRI to keep a pulse on. Um, and I've also been working with Nokia and AT&T on some of these aspects. So high level, that's Ameren. I don't want to consume too much time. 
Um, any questions or comments or Rush, you want to take it over? Thank you, John. Thank you for that excellent presentation. Uh, yeah, uh, we do have a few minutes and thank you, uh, John, for uh, presenting that uh, on time. Um, you know, if any, um, uh, we have any questions, I don't see anything on the chat um, early, but I'm not sure if anybody has raised a hand to ask questions to John. I have a quick question. Okay, there was somebody. Was it Mark? That was Mark. Yeah, I, I didn't. I was in process of typing it on a chat, but I'll go ahead and ask it since, since we got a second. John, in terms of uh, kind of adopting the private LTE and, and uh, the fact that that the uh, you can take advantage of of technology that's available for the internet in general and probably probably helps. But how does the architecture? Uh, fit for plugging in, say, customer technologies that might, you might be managed as part of the grid, whether it's electric vehicle charging or smart thermostats or customer-owned storage. How, how does that fit in the architecture, you know, with, with the way you're, you're going? So, um, great question. Uh, high level, the, um, the private LTE will extend our network and make it pervasive across that 64,000 square miles. <clears throat> so the intent is to have reachability to customers who want to participate, say, in rooftop solar control for power quality. Um, and so those are those are elements we want to be able to provide the communications access into our network where we can control those inverters, make them a part of whatever DERMS management system we would employ, as well as the voltage optimization that we can pick up both from the meter and the feeder at the, at the head end to help with that quality control and efficiency. Um, In-home thermostats right now, I think you're going to see that travel through the public internet because the, the people generally aren't going to want us to get in there and control those assets, but we'll provide an uh, interface through an APN back into our network. So logically, the customer doesn't have to discern how they get through. We can make that um, access available to them, um, whether it's an app or a PC at home, uh, but the meter connection would come through our network. And the, the other thing I'll tell you is a number of manufacturers are already including band 8, the 900 support in a lot of their products. Well, LNG has come out with a cell modem underneath the glass that supports band 8. You're seeing a number of manufacturers looking at supporting either third party modems or working with people like Sierra to put this technology. Uh, long term, Mark, what we want to see is eSIMs where we have over the air programmability of of those devices for firmware and updates, but also that you can ride different networks. In our testing, uh, because we we're controlling interrupters and load flow on a production system, which is still in production, we want those um, modems to be able to ride our private network, but if for some reason that wasn't available, fail over to the public carrier. We successfully tested that. There was no uh, notice of issue um, on the um, advanced distribution management head end. Um, and it took seconds to reconverge. So it, it's very successful in terms of reliability. Excellent. Thank you, John. I appreciate that uh, feedback. I had a question, but we did get one question on the chat, uh, and we have a minute, um, John, if you don't mind me asking that question. This question comes from uh, Prataban Moodley, um, and the question is, John, how does your utility deal with time-sensitive services, such as telecontrol on the packet-based network? Yeah, so excellent question. And if we get too deep into it, um, I'll probably have to get a research answer for you. Some of this work we did do with EPRI, Tim Godfrey, uh, Ron Cunningham out of AEP was instrumental in putting a whole uh, taxonomy on timing and utilities, but specific to interruptors, all of our critical assets ride on a fiber network. And so we have, by design, under four milliseconds for transfer trip in the old analog days. We put that on a packet-based network where we're upgrading RTUs. We're seeing uh, sub one millisecond response times. And of course, there's multi-pass for controlling those transfer trips. Um, right now, we have a mix of point-to-point -point and packet-based, but the primary is all being moved to a packet-based um, communication. Hopefully, I answered the question. 
Thank you, John. I think um, you did. Uh, we will have more time uh, in the discussion once uh, all of the panelists run through their presentation. So our next uh, panelist is uh, Laura Pierpoint from Exelon Corporation. Laura, over to you. Laura, you must be on mute. There you go. Uh, for some reason, your voice is breaking up. Is it me or? Uh, okay, it's better now. Thanks, Laura. Oh, you must be still on mute, Lara. Sorry. There you go. Can you hear me now? Okay. You can hear you. Okay. I'll see if there's a bit of an echo, but hopefully that'll work. I'll really Laura, for some reason, your voice is breaking up. I can see a small icon on your uh, screen saying that um, the bandwidth might be low. Rish, um, this is Omar. Perhaps uh, maybe we could uh, uh, switch over uh, and uh, come back to Laura. Yeah, that's Larry. Right. We'll do that, Laura. Uh, while you're working on it, um, you know, we'll come back to you. Give us ten minutes, and we'll come back to you on your presentation. We can go with Larry. Uh, Larry, if you're ready, I'll right. we'll just quickly move the slides to Larry. All right. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Larry. Great. Good morning, and uh, thank you. And apologize on, on Laura's behalf, and hopefully we get her back on because I know she's uh, dynamic and. Um, Exelon has a lot to offer, so I'm looking forward to, to hearing her remarks here as well. So if we can, uh, do I have the slides? Do I forward here? I think you, you should have the controls. Yeah. There we go. Let's go to Portland General Electric. Okay. All right. Well, good morning, and, and, and thank you for uh, allowing me to participate on the panel. Uh, I have to say that EPRI and, and Stanford on the uh, Bits and Watts are two of my favorite research groups and uh, really love working with each of the teams and, and uh, appreciate all the efforts that uh, you're doing for the industry, for utilities and for our customers. Um, I, you know, I'm very mindful of you know, what has taken place uh, you know, here with the COVID. Uh, and if you monitored and looked at the April emissions re reports for worldwide, the emissions were down 16 or 17%. Uh, which is phenomenal when we think about uh, air quality, we think about uh, what our future looks like. And I have to say that I believe customers are really going to be driving for decarbonization. They're going to be asking us to do things um, really as we go into this future. And um, the, the digital world that we're talking about is, is critical. And uh, we're not going to be able to accomplish um, these goals of decarbonization for the future without it. And uh, the image that I put up on the screen here is uh, showing you on the left-hand side, which has been our traditional generation side of the business. Um, and, and here at Portland General Electric, we are an inter uh, vertically integrated utility, so we still have both sides of this equation and, and how we operate. Um, and so I'll share with you a few thoughts about maybe some advantages on that behalf. But we've traditionally done the integrated resource plans. We've thought about what uh, it takes in terms of generation, and and uh, we're having some concerns here in the the West on you know what is our regional adequacy and and uh, planning tools and how we're thinking about the day ahead, uh, how we uh, put markets in place, different than obviously other places in the United States and across the the globe. But all of us think about generation, and uh, I think we've done a really good job. We've gotten to the point where we monitor, we forecast, we um, uh, deal with that on an uh, instantaneous basis, you know, really, really well and thinking about our transmission the same way. But over on the far right is what I'll refer to as the distribution side of this world. 
And uh, Mark uh, alluded to distribution resource planning, and we do not have good robust systems in thinking about the distribution network and what is required there. Um, we don't have, uh, you know, the, as distributed energy resources, all these customer dynamic devices that are going to be put on our system, um, how do we see those? What do they look like? How much influence do we have on them? Um, and, and customers are really, you know, stepping up. And I would say transportation electrification is probably going to be the single greatest impact on our system that we've seen, maybe since Tesla, Westinghouse uh, were all uh, thinking about AC and DC uh, way back when. Um, it is going to have a significant impact on us. And Mark alluded to flexible feeders. And so if we're going to balance between the generation on the far left and the distribution on the right, and to get to the decarbonization, the 100% that uh, many of our customers are asking for, it's going to take as much in the distribution world as we have in the generation world. And I've laid that dispatch up there at the top um, because utilities, if we're going to provide those services in the center there, um, we've got to be able to see both sides. We need to be able to influence both sides and we need to be able to encourage um, both in the customer arena as well as, you know, new renewables on the, uh, the generation side to form that 100%. And so that's the challenge in front of us. And uh, as I flip to the next slide, John talked about communication systems. And so this uh, is kind of a depiction um, that Anant uh, um, Sundaram uh, from my team uh, had put together. Um, usually I've got boxes uh, that are kind of ugly, and but he had done a nice job of, of capturing here many of the aspects that we think about and, and the systems that we currently have and the systems that we need. And there's that green box in the center that calls out grid management systems that we have not created yet. We've got parts and pieces, but are we really uh, holistically, have we figured it out yet such that like our generation, we can monitor, model it, know what it's going to do tomorrow. And so if we've got a strain on the system, what are we going to do at 3 p.m. tomorrow? And so we need those sensors. We need the interconnection, if you will, to the field. And as John talked about the communication networks that are in between of that, those are the things that we've got to build out. And we've got to think hard about how does transportation play in that? You know, the, the batteries, if you will, and, and vehicle to grid as well as grid to vehicle, that flexibility of load is, is going to be huge for us in thinking about how we operate this grid of the future. And if we don't have visibility into it, if we don't have the sensors there, then that becomes a blind spot for us and it becomes a, a, a portion that is really hard to deal with. And we end up overbuilding our system, charging more for it, and, um, and in fact, having a difficult time dealing with those parts and pieces if we don't have visibility, we don't have sensors there. So, so it's really important for us to think about how these systems come together and how we operate that going into the future and providing customers the opportunity to participate in this decarbonization with us. And so that's kind of what this last um, uh, slide that I have is, is depicting. Um, for a while as we were starting down uh, with the architecture, I thought a lot about um, uh, this little depiction in the, in the the center of the page from a substation out, all the different parts and pieces, and you can see that it became the running man because we were all trying to figure out as quickly as possible, how do we combine these? How do we put these devices on our system and where they're going to be showing up and are we getting ahead of that? Well, on that far left side, you see it's decarbonization, it's resiliency, it's cost savings. Those are things that customers are really looking for. And on the far right, we have the grid, which is thinking about you know, the, the value of those devices, the reliability of those devices and operational efficiencies. And so we're gonna to be torn apart. We, we're thinking both directions. What is the customer value? What's the system value? And we need to really be able to balance that. But it's gonna take sensors, it's gonna take communication systems, it's gonna take the control systems up front to be able to do that and interface with uh, those products and services. And so um, those are the challenges I see when we think about this digital world, we're going to build a digital twin of our system. And that digital twin is going to help us facilitate our planning, 
our um, actual resource uh, thoughts for the next day. How much flexibility do I have on feeder A versus feeder B? And if I combine those, do I have enough to help balance on the system for the transmission issue that I might have tomorrow? Those are all the questions that, that we as operators have to begin to think through and provide that information to that dispatcher that's sitting at the, at the, uh, the desk. So I'm gonna stop there. Um, look forward to further uh, comments that uh, hopefully we can get through on, on Laura and uh, as well as the questions from the panelists. So thank you. Thank you, Larry. Really appreciate that excellent background. Uh, another uh, view of a uh, utility, but you know, just trying to get, look into the common themes, uh, looking from John and, and you uh, in terms of the emissions and the environmental stewardship, it becomes very critical. Another thing I, I learned is that you know, uh, how network and this smart infrastructure and communications become a backbone to enable that uh, integration and data platform and, and flexibility, for example, and finally, you know, you can't address this uh, environmental problem, carbon problem, without looking at all the sectors, the generation sectors or electricity use sector or transportation sector, uh, and how the network and the communications tie all of them together. So excellent background. I appreciate that. Um, we can, um, we will, we have a few minutes. So we can open the door for questions from the um, uh, audience. Do you have any questions, Arlie? Anybody raising their hands? I see a question on uh, uh, talking about the digital twin. All right. Uh, we have a question from Mark McGranigan on the chat. Um, I'll uh, repeat that uh, on a question for uh, all the uh, um, you know attendees. Uh, love the digital twin concept applied to the power system. How far uh, down into the community slash customer do we go? You know, that's, that's the great question. We traditionally have thought about just our distribution systems. And, um, you know, I think uh, John had mentioned the distribution automation and the equipment that we normally run. You can see batteries, et cetera, being in a similar way. You can see the inverters being in a similar way. But we've got to go beyond that if we're going to get into actually building management. So you think about all the chillers that are out there that are connected and how do we communicate and and start to enhance and, and use that as, as part of that uh, flexible load, if you will. Um, it comes in lots of different varieties. Um, I would say that we're thinking about it, uh, as John was, in a neighborhood net area network, kind of one step below um, what we call our field area network, as a private LTE network, um, where those devices communicate. And, and I think he mentioned possibly through web. Um, is that the best way to do that? But certainly we need to be able to influence. And um, you know, when you call upon it, if you only get 60% of it, is that, a, is that gonna be enough for tomorrow's needs um, at 3 p.m. when you hit the peak of the heat? Uh, need to understand that. And that's why flexibility, and what are the metrics associated with flexibility on a feeder? And how much do you have? So much like we track uh, maybe our generation profile to see how much hydro, how much wind, how much solar, how much thermal uh, we might have on the system at any one time. We're gonna be doing that with the distribution system as well and saying, we have flexibility here. Energy efficiency was kind of locked down and helped us with capacity, but these dynamic devices, we're gonna to need to communicate with them on a direct basis and be able to influence a large number of them. It's, it's one thing, I, I always think about LED lights and change out one of the house, you didn't see any difference. Change out all the lights, all of a sudden you saw a difference on your bill. Well, it's the same with your customers. If you have a few participating in our test beds and, and as Mark was describing these pilots, that's one thing. But if you have millions of customers participating, it becomes a real flexibility that uh, we need on our systems. Excellent. Um, thank you, Larry. I appreciate that background. Um, let's jump into Laura's presentation. I'll uh, roll back uh, to her presentation. Laura, can you hear, hear me? She, must be on the she is trying to call in, um, but I do not see her right now. Okay, not a problem. We'll probably give her a minute and then try to uh, see if there's another question. There is another question here on the chat. Um, the question from Mark McGranigan uh, is, is community and customer storage part of the resiliency, um, Larry? 
Oh, absolutely. Um, huge. I, I think that's, a, that's, again, one of those flexibilities. And as I talk about transportation, I see that as part of the storage equation as well. But you can imagine, and, and we've been partnering up uh, with, I'll use Daimler as the example here, building uh, electric uh, vehicles and thinking about charging stations. And uh, EPRI's uh, charging um, committee, uh, I know Maria Pope, is our CEO, is, is leading uh, and, and working with EPRI on that behalf. It's when you're going to put a megawatt or a megawatt and a half of a charger for a truck on your distribution system, that's a huge impact. And so you have to think about storage. You have to think about buffering the system with batteries. And so that flexibility gives you lots of options. And then you start to think about school buses and how often are they running and when they're sitting still, can you use them as part of that flexibility that you need on the system? Absolutely. Those are all you know, key elements that we need to think about in terms of storage. And if we can do that with homes, um, you know, I know there's a lot of test pilots going out there right now where you have hundreds of homes. Can you consolidate that? Think about the flexibility on a feeder, given you have, let's say, four or 500 homes on that particular feeder. Uh, that becomes then uh, real flexibility on a system. So storage is key. We're doing also um, uh, microgrids and uh, a number of communities uh, really asking for that. And so we built out a few uh, examples now where it was starting as just their emergency operating centers. They're going beyond that, and they're starting to think further how they build resiliency in their communities uh, for times where there might be uh, a disaster, an earthquake, et cetera. So, so we're seeing a lot of requests now where storage plays a different role in terms of resiliency. Excellent. Thank you, Larry. That's good background. Uh, and, and we were just looking at uh, recently a discussion on not just, you know, you mentioned the flexibility metrics, you know, metrics, whether it's power, whether it's energy, right, or it's both uh, at some point of time. Uh, you know, if our California is looking at long duration storage, looking at 150 hour of energy uh, capacity, right? Um, so each of those have different values to look into that stream uh, that uh, has different, uh, you know, diff meets a different objective of an electric grid. So excellent background. We do have one more question, if you could quickly go over that. Uh, this is from Ryan Fede. Um, the question is, uh, Larry, can you speak uh, to the change aspect of this shift? Uh, absolutely, and thank you, Ryan. Appreciate the uh, question, uh, uh, and I hope you're doing well. Uh, past um, co-worker at Bonneville Power, so uh, um, appreciate the question. I, I think um, we're making a real shift from um, what was in the past energy efficiency, and, and many of our teams that interfaced with customers, that was one of the key elements that we, we dealt with customers and we worked with them. It was all associated with energy efficiency. And now we have these dynamic devices. And if you really thought about uh, dispatch system operations personnel, line personnel, um, they really didn't deal with the energy efficiency. They weren't involved in that. And now you're asking these planners, these dispatchers to think about devices that you're putting on the system and how you interface with customers associated with that. And uh, so it's really causing a cultural change as well to think about using the advancement, using these devices, and no longer is it just about the system value over there on the right hand of the chart that's still shown. You really have to start to think about the customer value and what our customers are desiring and how do you provide peace of mind to them? How do you give them a different experience? How do you provide that integration of, of their equipment and give them opportunities to use that? And so the cultural changes is huge uh, going from what was Oh, it's the sales team over there versus the operators over on that side of the two, two. You're having to bring them together now and work collaboratively. Excellent. Thank you, Larry. Uh, let's give uh, another shout out to uh, Lara. Um, Lara, can you uh, hear me? I just sent her some, some information. I'm trying to see if she can log in within a couple minutes. Okay, not a problem, Orly. Thank you for uh, trying that. So, Larry, we, uh, uh, we do have one more question. I, uh, I skipped the order, unfortunately. I didn't see this earlier. Uh, this is a question from uh, Nisreen Krami. And the question is, how far can we go with uh, DER integration with less digital transformation? Well, I, I think we're going to find that out. Um, 
And, and uh, I can speak from a little bit of experience here uh, recently uh, on our own system here at Portland General Electric with uh, solar applications for residential customers in uh, uh, net metering uh, circumstances, but uh, where feeders uh, you're trying to use an IEEE standard of, of 90% of the uh, minimum loading on a uh, feeder to try to make sure that uh, if you don't have protection systems in place, that you don't back feed into the, the substation you know, and your protect, protection systems aren't capable of handling that. You know, that's a great example where we got into a situation where we've got a number of feeders that, that fall into that category. They're old electromechanical relays, et cetera. We don't have a protection system. How do you make sure and model um, and, and provide the opportunity to work with that? And, and so we had to go with a two meter system to be able to trip that generation offline if we get into a condition where the uh, system can't handle that. Because otherwise you're going to spend probably a half a million dollars in upgrading all of the uh, equipment, the protection, et cetera, on that distribution feeder. Eventually you're going to need to do that, but, but, but we're bumping up against some of those limits today. And um, we need to solve that issue each time uh, we run against it. But it takes good modeling, it takes the good you know, forecast of the digital information that uh, provides that you can design a, a better system. Great, thank you, Larry. I mean, the, that's a very good question. Then what can you do now and what can you do uh, with more digital uh, transformation, et cetera? So I do see Laura um, on the call. Um, Laura, can you hear us? All right. Yes, yes I can hear you. Can you. Perfect. Can you Great. hear me? Yeah, please. Yeah, I can hear you. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for bearing with me. I, um, of course, wanted to make sure that I provided a really strong demonstration of the importance of a communication backbone as we're having this particular discussion. So, um, so great. Um, so thank you all again for, for letting me join you today. Uh, I'll give you some perspectives on Exxon and what we are doing in the realm of digital grid. So to give a little bit of background on Exxon as a company, we have 12 million customers across the United States. A little over 10 million of those customers are in our regulated utility footprint, ComEd in Chicago, as well as uh, utilities across the Atlantic seaboard. And then we have another roughly 2 million customers within our competitive retail business. Um, of course, we also have generation in the competitive markets in several locations within the United States. Um, my role within Exelon is actually uh, at the corporate side, and, uh, and I'm the director of technology strategy. So that means that my team and I are really looking forward at what we, what we see down the road and kind of around the corners with respect to technologies across the board for things that are of interest to Exelon, and then of course specifically within the realm of digital grid type assets. Uh, so to that end, we run our R&D program and work with universities and national labs. Uh, we also work with startups and sort of in the early to mid stages of the innovation pipeline. And in general, we're looking for the things that we'd like to deploy in about a year to say three years, um, or in some cases even longer than that if we see particularly game-changing technologies on the horizon. So I'll be talking a little bit about our perspective on kind of the future of what the digital grid might look like. And of course, as we talk today, I'm happy to give some examples as well of what's already happening within some of our utility footprints. Uh, but going to this first slide here, I think it's really important to continue to ground and not just, you know, how we are doing things and what's available with respect to digital grid assets, but really why are we taking the particular actions we're taking? And of course, we like others, you know, I think this has come up a couple of times so far today. We're really focused on our customers and creating customer value. And so to do that, we think about what customers really want and what they expect from their electric service. Um, so the first and foremost thing is, you know, I think all customers are really come to expect sleek and easy interfaces. And they want to be able to interact with their energy systems the same way they interact through their iPhones with myriad other kinds of services that they elect to have. Um, in addition, I think we're seeing a move toward integrated services. And again, I think you've heard a fair amount about this already today. You know, energy and security and thinking about a whole home approach, a way that you can have a single interface to interact with a number of things that, that could work together within your home. Uh, a lot of folks, of course, having digital assistants in their home and increasingly using those to control various aspects of their appliances within their house, as well as other kinds of services as well. I note here that this is where we get into really some of the important trade-offs, particularly with privacy. 
I don't put privacy here as kind of an end in of itself. Uh, the way that we think about privacy is that it's really a necessary condition for all of this work, as it has been really for everything that utilities have done since their inception. And what's interesting about this challenge with privacy is that customers approach it differently. We have customers that really value the ease of use and really want to be able to move seamlessly from one kind of service to another. We have other customers that are much more concerned about privacy and really want to see protection of their data as being front and center. And sometimes there are some real trade-offs around how quickly and easily we can innovate and the extent to which we're really thinking about privacy protections. So that's something that we always have in mind. Of course, everyone wants 100% reliability or as close as we can get to that. And that's only increasing in importance as our lives become more digital and more reliant on various kinds of electric appliances. And then I note that some customers want more choice. So that means that you know, there are customers who are interested in really you know, deciding very specifically what sorts of energy services they have, thinking about the ways in which their energy efficiency interacts with distributed energy resources and options for grid power. But I think part of what we see also is that the majority of our customers want to know that they're getting electricity that is as inexpensive, as reliable, and as clean as possible. And ideally, they'd like to know that that's what they're getting and then to be able to sort of set things and forget them and think more about the sort of other kinds of value add services within their lives. So then we think a little bit on the flip side of that, what is it that we're thinking about as utilities? And again, a lot of this has come up today. We're managing variable resources. We're managing the integration of electric vehicles, uh, distributed generation. And I think this is extremely important, you know, particularly understanding exactly what's on our system and how we can manage those system assets, how to visualize those appropriately. We're managing aging, aging assets. And as we do all of this, of course, thinking about the customer's needs. I think part of what also makes this challenging, and this is what my team tries to think about, is not just the technologies, but what are the business models and the institutional arrangements that really enable their effectiveness. So we're thinking about how grid operators, the policymakers, and regulators play within these kinds of systems, how we communicate with them, and how having new kinds of digital assets and data can enable us to make better cases and have more open and transparent discussions with our regulators. We also think about how we interact at the city level. We think about our vendors and technology developers. And then, of course, potential new institutional actors that in some regions of the country are not so new. So we're seeing aggregators and, and demand side system operators popping up in various places. So thinking about how all of this ultimately fits together is very important. So moving to the next slide. Then thinking about this a little bit further from the utility perspective, we really are focused right now on some of the emerging infrastructure challenges as being some of the base issues that we're hoping to solve with some of the tools out there. Um, so certainly we're looking at distributed energy products. We're seeing data as necessary for helping with electrification decisions and figuring out how to electrify where. We also, of course, have decarbonization as very front of mind. Um, and we're thinking about how we make our investments and try to optimize those, again, you know, as we see requirements from the public, particularly for low carbon, but other kinds of demands as well from the customer side of the equation. In terms of the solutions that we're pursuing, I think they're similar to what, the, what other folks have presented today, both John and Larry are seeing within their electric territories. Obviously, interesting user-friendly digital tools, things that have very clear interfaces for communicating with our customers are going to be more and more important. We also talk about machine learning, AI, other ways of ingesting and really utilizing our data. Uh, and then, of course, thinking about those visualization tools that we're going to need to speak to our regulators in addition to our customers. Um, we think about data tools, and of course, this is an ongoing challenge that we have data across our enterprise. It's really important to us to try to harmonize and to be able to utilize our data effectively. And in our case, when we have separate utilities across many different kinds of jurisdictions, there's a lot we're trying to do to figure out how we can synthesize and harmonize and really provide value to lift all of our utilities at the same time, which is very challenging. Um, and then finally, you know, to make sure that we're being holistic as we do this. Um, and as we go about this work, we're really looking at what's happening, particularly in Silicon Valley and in other big startup hubs around the country, where we see really interesting new kinds of technologies and products that are emerging. And we're trying to figure out to what extent do we bring things in-house? Do we sort of, you know, similarly try to develop our own tools? To what extent do we partner with folks outside? And to what extent do we potentially even buy or start to acquire various kinds of technology solutions? 
go to the next slide. So I'll conclude with just a few pieces of information about some of the things that we're doing a little bit more on the bleeding edge of the R&D side. We're partnered with Argonne National Lab in a project that we're calling Array of Things. So Argonne and a team there led by Charlie Catlett and, and various others have put a platform out. They call this the Waggle platform, which is a whole set of smart city sensors that are already deployed now in the Bronzeville neighborhood as well as other locations around Chicago. Uh, and the idea with this particular project is to figure out how we can leverage these smart city sensor networks specifically for utility applications. So as one example, these sensors include solar insulation um, sensors, and we're looking to see if we can get a really granular sense of the potential for solar insulation and ultimately very granular prediction so that in the future we might be able to have a really good handle on what sort of output we're expecting from our DER resources in the, in the region. Um, then we're also working with MIT on a project we call Building Level Energy Modeling. Christoph Reinhardt and his team have put together really interesting algorithms to very rapidly assess energy efficiency opportunities across an entire city. And they have really creative ways of bringing in all kinds of public data as well as data that the utility can provide and really do good assessments of energy efficiency opportunities that are really increasing in accuracy over time and particularly as we're able to add more data to these models. So we think this can be really interesting for lead generation and helping our customers understand where they may be able to really benefit from energy efficiency retrofits. And then finally, we have a project with MIT and Stephen Lieb in his lab. We call this one autonomous DER controllers. In this case, Professor Lieb and his students have developed a new kind of non-invasive load sensor and controller that could actually be connected outside of people's homes. And what these, what these sensors would do is actually sense the loads within each home, and then the sensors would communicate with one another through a control mechanism would then be able to effectively decide when to turn certain loads on and off, but do this all in an autonomous fashion that preserves privacy. So what you could imagine is that if we deployed a couple of these sensor controllers across a, a system of houses on a particular feeder, we can ensure that we only have a certain number of HVAC systems on at any given time, and this would help us to meet our hosting capacity requirements while potentially keeping our customers more comfortable because instead of having to reduce their thermostats, they could just be staggering the times at which they're running their HVAC systems and maintaining a certain temperature. Um, so I'll pause there and look forward to taking questions from folks. Uh, I think we have a lot that's going on that's interesting and a lot that we're hoping to pull together within what we call our connected communities vision for our utilities. Thank you. Excellent, Laura. That's a wonderful presentation. Thanks for coming back. Um, and sorry we had some issues there. You did an excellent job uh, on, on uh, your presentation and a great summary uh, and from my perspective, how you're really applying digital technologies and trying to address real issues and how you're using the data from the customers, you know, your autonomous uh, DER controllers is a very good example of innovation and research that are happening in this project. Um, so we have, I would say, uh, 50 15 minutes. I want to give a minute for Omar to close out, but uh, now we have 15 minutes open for the questions. We do have some questions um, on the chat. I will go through that first, and then we'll kind of open up the floor for um, other questions. First, I'll start with the question uh, that was posed to all the panelists. Huh? This is from Liang Meng from Stanford. Uh, what role will AMI slash smart meter system play in the future of this customer-centric world? So, you know, um, uh, uh, and either of you could uh, take that question. Let me, this is Larry, we'll jump in real quick. Uh, I did add a little bit of, uh, to, onto the chat there to say, you know, clearly as we add in transportation electrification, we have a whole bunch of chargers that are going to be added. That is just another meter, a different form of that. Um, these are sensors that are out in, and, you know, as we are thinking about how we communicate, how we use those sensors, much like uh, Laura just demonstrated the autonomous uh, DER controller, uh, is that eventually going to be built into the meter? Uh, is that something that uh, we want to consider? I, I think those are plenty of, there's lots of opportunities there to think about um, what can that meter do further than, than just providing the data, the, the sensing that it has right now. Excellent. Thank you, Larry. Uh, you know, John, any perspective? Yeah, so, 
Rich, just uh, real quick, I, the meter is going to play a significant role. Um, you'll pull data from that meter for bolt bore optimization, power quality. <clears throat> Uh, but starting uh, real soon as we roll out our smart meter program in Missouri, we're going to offer four different new time of use plans for customers in Missouri, um, allowing them to default into one plan, but opt into other plans. There'll, there'll be dynamic time of use plans. Uh, and the goal there is as the adoption of DERs increases, you know, at a max level, the time of use rates will evolve to dynamic pricing programs. And that's going to be required so that, you know, instead of having to force curtail that, you'll use pricing to incent and, and curtail customer usage. You'll still want the ability to manage and control, you know, what's backfitting through that feeder potentially, but utilizing um, the customer desire and the meter to control that. Excellent. Thank you, John. I, I, I completely agree with you. I want to give an opportunity to Lara. Lara, do you have any perspective? On this? Yeah, yeah, I think this is actually a really interesting question because I certainly agree that particularly in the near term, smart meters are going to be a very important piece of the equation and a very important source of data. But we do actually wonder sometimes how far in the future that might hold. And I think it depends on the other kinds of sensors and the other kinds of controllers that we wind up deploying throughout businesses, throughout homes, and throughout our network. So you could see a situation, for example, where if we're really starting to, you know, network all of our appliances and potentially even put specialized controllers within the house or other kinds of sensors within the house that, you know, integrate with other sorts of systems like security systems, it may be that we have sufficient and different kinds of data coming from an array of sensors throughout the city, throughout the home, and throughout commercial businesses that we wind up actually relying less and less on the meter data itself. Um, I think, you know, there are some big questions around that and we have a pretty strong debate internally around, you know, will we ever try to seek to control a customer's coffee pot turning on and off? And of course the answer to that is, is, is really not in part because our customers are going to want to start the coffee when they want to start the coffee, but, um, but also because we're really, you know, thinking about ultimately managing probably larger loads. But I think it's an interesting question to consider is to really think about you know, where, where is the level of control going to reside and to what extent are we going to be very granular in how customers interact with their electricity usage and how we interact with them. And so you could see in some sense potentially a decreasing role for smart meters going forward depending on how the rest of that shapes up. Excellent point, Lara. I mean, not just about the control, of, you know, how much control you need, but what also needs to be controlled. Uh, that's an important point. Related to that topic, I think I, I have a question for all the panelists uh, a, a, at a higher level. Uh, you know, everybody mentioned about smart technologies, networks, and communications, and even data um, access, cybersecurity, et cetera, are important aspects. But to really integrate them into the utility, you need to also create markets. I think uh, uh, everyone said the same thing in terms of creating programs and markets that enable uh, the flexibility or customer resources to play a very critical role in addressing good reliability with new needs, et cetera. And we have a, a clearly seen, uh, it's a fork study or many other uh, research studies that I have done in the past, is, is, you know, having those both markets of dynamic pricing that John, you just mentioned, moving from TOU to dynamic pricing eventually, and, and then also having these smart consumer technologies play a very important role in, in seeing how uh, you know, how much flexibility can we get and how much reliable flexibility we can get because reliability and persistency plays a very critical role. Reliability for making sure if customer says they're going to do something, you can rely on that, right? And persistency is, you know, every time you ask the customers to do that, can they persistently provide that? Um, you know, and, and, and in within this, the data plays a very key role in that whole decision-making process. Um, you know, your forecasting as well as real-time monitoring measurement, verification, et cetera. So what value do you see, uh, you know, evolving uh, from this customer data uh, that might help electric utility manage uh, its, uh, you know, uh, grid more reliably and uh, in a more resilient manner? 
Yeah, I'll go ahead and, and jump in. I mean, I think that's a it's a really interesting question, and it's really important that we understand this. And I think, and I think the key point here is that we will come to understand what the potential is, particularly for kind of demand side responsiveness. Um, in light of these kinds of time of use programs over time. So obviously when we start our first pilot, it's not gonna be quite clear the answers to some of the questions you're asking about consistency uh, and you know, in total amount of response. But I think as we move forward, we're starting to learn more and more about the right level of aggregation, about exactly how many systems are required in order to achieve the kind of reliability that we'll need from that side of the equation. And the more data we get, um, both in terms of time and in terms of number of participants, the more clear it will be exactly to what extent we can rely on these kinds of services. And I feel very optimistic that there'll be an extraordinarily robust and important piece of the system going forward. Wonderful. Anyone else? I guess I would uh, chime in with, with Laura and agree. Um, and I think I think we as utilities, you know, we we're, we have to be very sensitive to how we're operating a grid and thinking about reliability and affordability, et cetera. But I think we really need to shift our attention onto the customer and thinking about the customer experience and, you know, what are they, uh, they don't want the complication. And, you know, you look at many of our tests and trials um, and the complexity of systems and, and uh, you know, how often do I have to reboot this thing? Uh, how often do I have to talk to this thing? Um, customers are going to want, you know, things that are simple, easy to operate. Uh, um, I, I'll, I'll use a quick example of uh, uh, a tankless hot water tank that I put in that uh, actually uh, learned what I did for the first seven days, and then it performs on that basis. So how are we putting those things into play um, uh, to help us in, into the grid? So customers are going to want things that uh, are much easier. Um, and yes, that they know they're participating, that they're effective, they want um, the advice from, you know, their energy partners to think, how can I transition? We have groups that are coming to us from uh, companies and saying, we want to transition to this decarbonized world, uh, but I don't know how to do that for my house. What do I need to do for my house? And um, how can I do participate in this? And so, again, I think we have to turn our attention to thinking about customers and their desires as much as what we've traditionally done on the grid. Thanks a lot. I got anything from you, John? Yeah, just uh, briefly, I, I think um, Laura and Larry did a good job answering it far better than I would. I think about, you know, as you in the short term, as you manage the grid and you look at localized um, load and, and resources, um, I, I worry about the third parties that are going to come in and sell customers' goodness on the backs of the utility, and we focused on grid reliability in the traditional DMS, um, and I worry that we lose sight of how quick retailers can work and put that edge computing out there and give solutions and, and opportunities to our customers who really don't care about the reliability of the grid until it affects them individually. So I, I think we have to be cognizant of what those disruptors are. We don't have to control them. We need to partner and understand those. I think about you know, edge computing and blockchain, transactive energy right at the feeder. Um, I don't know what that looks like, but that's a concern that we have to understand those capabilities. The other thing you talked about data, I think that the, the key thing in any application you talked about ease of use is the reliability and accuracy. If we provide solutions that don't work, don't provide meaningful information or have bad data, you're going to lose your customers, your interest in whatever program you're working on. We all understand there's a startup, but you really need to strive for the credibility and reliability of that data. Timeliness is also a factor. Absolutely. I appreciate that, John. I couldn't agree with you the accuracy and the whole data integrity, right? I used to be a data scientist myself a long time ago. I started that, you know, how much time it really took to clean the data. It's severely underestimated in the industries. So, you know, bad data, garbage in, garbage out, right? So we know that. Really appreciate that. Thank you. We've got some excellent set of questions coming in from the uh, attendees uh, on the chat. Uh, I don't believe we'll get time to go through everything, but we'll try to do as many as possible. Uh, this question is a two-part question um, uh, to all the panelists. Uh, this started from Jonathan um, Sandham. Um, the question is, does the role of disaggregation or submetering become more important into the future 
uh, as we are looking at a lot more than just kilowatt hour in the future, you know, going beyond kilowatt hour, uh, the, the, the disaggregation submetering become important. The second part of that is, of the that thought is, uh, Mark and adding to it is, will third party offer these energy services um, enabled by submetering, and how should the utility interface with these third parties um, um, and these energy services? So it's, it's, it's a related question. And one is the value of the submetering and aggregation itself. And the second one is how do you enable those aggregations with third party services? So um, anybody want to take this question first? Uh, this is Larry and I'll uh, try a little bit of it. Um, and uh, Laura and, and John probably to correct me. Um, I, as I think about, um, those submetered services, uh, we we know that it's going to change dramatically. Uh, Transportation electrification is a great example of that um, because now you've got a device that's moving around, may not even be on your system, it's going to somebody else's system, and yet that customer is going to want to maybe have a flat rate uh, for their uh, electrical electric fueling. I'll, I'll use that term. I'm not quite sure uh, what we want to call it, just electric charging, but uh, um, but they're going to want to uh, make it easy uh, for wherever they're charging their, their vehicle. And um, so there's different services associated with that. But I, I, I would also say that uh, we had an experience here in Oregon where we talked about transportation electrification, and we call it make ready work. That's the, the work from the what would be traditionally a typical meter today to what would be the charging stations. And um, whether you've got fleet or it's going into uh, apartment complex, et cetera, but that make ready work um, traditionally has been under the National Electric Code instead of the National Electric Safety Code. So that's an electrician versus a journeyman lineman. Um, but yet uh, we in Oregon are looking at, well, let's make it a qualified worker that can work on that facility. And oh, by the way, can you, the utility, install that? Because the hurdle has been the charging companies would love to put chargers on, but the affording of the wires and conduit, et cetera, to get to the charging station um, has not has been a real barrier. And so we're seeing that if the utility can step into that space and provide that make ready, much like we do a line extension to a home, then all of a sudden that be, that barrier goes away. And um, so, so the services I think are going to change over time. And um, you know where the need is, and and how we, um, I guess, push for the those services is is going to be dependent, as Laura mentioned, of, with our regulators as well as what society is pushing for, what customers really want. Excellent, thank you, Larry. Mm -hmm. uh, I know we uh, we are almost like 9:29. Um, I I want to make sure I give a minute to Omar to wrap up um, uh, this uh, panel. So we do have some great questions still. Unfortunately, we're not able to get to it, but what I'll do is ask a rapid fire, two rapid fire questions. You'll get 10 seconds. So you could just say yes or no, or just say, hey, yes, we are doing this. So let me ask the question really quick. Um, um, you know, uh, Jesse uh, Naomi asked the question, any example or challenge that has been solved through machine learning applications? So, you know, uh, we can start with each one of you, rapid fire. No. Okay. Lara? <laughs> I don't have a specific example right now, but we're we're actually working pretty heavily with GE on a predix implementation within our utilities. And I think there are a couple of cases where we're likely to be able to leverage some machine learning in order to do some predictive maintenance, which we're very excited about. Excellent. Thank you. Larry? Yeah, the predictive maintenance on the generation thus far, but also uh, now we're uh, starting to see it from Things like um, services connected or transformers, uh, right homes to the right transformers, that sort of thing. Starting to see machine learning there. Excellent. Thank you. One last question from Glenn Pitchard. As an industry, have we missed the boat on smart inverters? John. I don't think so. I think it's evolving. Um, I do think smart inverters is probably one of the best um, changes and evolutions in our industry. The digital sine wave and the uh, the efficiency that you want to drive in the grid, I think it's uh, it's coming, and I think we need to 
embrace it even more if I understood the question right. I think that's great. Thanks, John. Lara? Yeah, I agree. I know that we have some legacy systems out there, but I remain hopeful that we'll see increased deployment of smart inverters and ultimately some replacement of some of the existing systems. Because I think this is extraordinarily, it's a valuable set of technologies that we're really going to want to leverage. Perfect. Thank you, Larry. Slow start. Uh, I agree with both Laura and, and, and John that um, technology, uh, in fact, utilities were somewhat resistant you know, in this process uh, at first making sure that we wanted to get safety, protection, all those things correct. But I would also challenge us that uh, we but we didn't know that we needed 45 foot class two poles uh, 100 years ago either. Uh, we're gonna learn as we go. Excellent, great summary guys. I, I think uh, of both ladies and gentlemen, uh, I, 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 this has exceeded my expectation, certainly in terms of knowledge and learnings, but also in terms of uh, the relevancy to this particular digital grid workshop that we collectively can get um, in, in crafting our research goals on new collaborative models, et cetera. So with this, uh, I really appreciate our, uh, you guys joining us. It's been an humbling experience, and uh, I'm glad to have you all in the panel um, um, you know, and, and providing your insights. Really appreciate that. Thank you. Omar, back to thank you. you. Fantastic. Rish, thank you. Thank you to all the panelists, and on behalf of uh, our colleagues at Stanford, Bits and Watts, and EPRI, uh, we appreciate everyone being on. Just a reminder, and we'll put up this slide here as we close, uh, we will have our European utility panel, uh, that's uh, session tomorrow at the same time, followed by on Thursday, our technology panel. So once again, we look forward to having you uh, participate, uh, attend those sessions. We again wanna thank uh, Larry, Laura, and John for your, um, uh, for your excellent presentations, Rish, for, uh, for your moderation, and uh, everyone for your time. Thank you so much. And we will be, uh, once we have the recording, we will send out information to everyone that's attended on how you can access the webcast recording and a PDF of the presentations as well. So with that, we will adjourn uh, the webcast. Thank you, and uh, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. you.